Okay, hi everybody, Renegade67 here with some more Duel Links Rush Duel content. Um, I have a game replay I want to talk about and share with you guys. Uh, I just thought it was an interesting game uh, between Magician Shuffle and Dark Arts Celerity. Uh, this is a bit of an outdated build for me from Magician Shuffle. Um, but uh, this is from when I, around the time I first got my third copy of Dark Magician Girl, which was the last card I needed three copies of to fully complete the first box set. So nice to have that done. But uh, yeah, this is the build I was running uh, for the duel. I was planning to show you my opponent's deck too, but um, I guess there's no way to actually do that through the replay feature. So let's just get into the duel. They're playing Dark Arts Celerity. So, um, <clears throat> my first time doing this, it might be a little weird, uh, there's gonna be some interesting turns I wanna talk about, but, uh, so, starting off, uh, well, what did I do, what did I do? Who went first? My opponent went first, what did they do? Going second, not a great place to be, usually, unless you have Dragius. If you have Dragius, going second can be alright. Dragius plus two 1500s means you get in for first damage, but usually going first is strongest, because your opponent, a lot of the time, won't be able to get in through for damage, which means you should be able to set up your board first, or you'll get in through damage first. Either way is generally good, but you know, sometimes your opponent opens Dragius and two 1500s, and they get in for a lot of damage, and that sucks. Um, I'm not playing Dragius, though, so... What do we got here? I use Magician Shuffle here, and I actually think this is, was a mistake. Um, so... I used Magician Shuffles here, uh, because I wanted to get my Dark Magician into the graveyard as soon as possible, but in hindsight, I regret this. Uh, I regret it almost immediately, because, um, like, he has two monsters, right? He's playing a Yami Ruler deck, maybe. He could just be playing good stuff. I don't know. I haven't really seen anything of his deck yet. He is playing Dark of Celerity, but I didn't know that yet. Um, so he's got two monsters, but, like... I don't really have effective ways of clearing his monsters. I've got a 1200, a 1300, and a 200. I could uh, tribute off the 200 and try to go for a Dark Magician Girl plus 1200 plus 1300 and hope that the 1300 clears, but like it's leaving such a vulnerable board behind um, that I decided to ultimately just set my other two monsters and uh, just summon the Dark Magician Girl, just clear one monster. But like if I'm going to do that, it's better to probably set the Dark Magician Girl um, because that way they might run into it if they don't know what it is. But I already have Magician Shuffle, so they can already predict what it is. So I wish I didn't do Magician Shuffle, because I can keep the Dark Magician in the deck. Because A, it wouldn't reveal what my skill is. Um, B, it wouldn't reveal I have Dark Magician Girl. And C, it keeps the Dark Magician Girl in the deck. So if I, if I'm going to set the Dark Magician, I mean, it keeps the Dark Magician in the deck. If I'm going to set the Dark Magician Girl anyways... Um, that doesn't really matter about the offense boost and keeping the Dark Magician in the deck means I basically have three ways to draw into Dark Magician Girl as opposed to now where I've gotten the Dark Magician out of the deck I only have two ways to draw into Dark Magician Girl going forward and this isn't a very good play because if it doesn't get in guaranteed damage it's not really, I don't know, it's not really worth it to decrease the Dark Magician Girls in my deck by one and it doesn't really make sense for me to summon Seven's Road here because then I don't get in for damage because I would only clear his two monsters and then I'm losing a big power play in Seven's Road so that's why I ultimately decided to just, you know, go for the one Dark Magician Girl. But if I was going to do that, I should have just said it, but, you know, blah, 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 blah. Because if you just clear one monster and leave them with one, six cards is still a good amount to, you know, make a comeback with. So I kind of regret this. I feel like if I was going to do this play, if I was going to follow through with Dark Magician Girl and the Magician Shuffle, I should have probably just summoned Rice Terrace and summoned the um, Thunder the Thunder and hoped the Thunder the Thunder cleared so I could get in for 1200. I think that's definitely the play. You either do that or you set three. I think what I was doing here was too middle groundy and probably incorrect. <clears throat> I probably could have cleared because that was just a 1500. What was his other monster? And he summons Kimi Ruler here. Could I have cleared? Yes, I could have cleared. I could have cleared and I could have gotten in for damage. Definitely should have done that if I wasn't gonna if I was planning to use Magician Shuffle. So oops on my part. But anyways, my opponent's about to have a big turn. They get two Kimi rulers! That's a lot. And it's gonna show one of the downsides of uh, Dark Magician Girl. She can be 2500, but she can't clear 2500 without crashing. And now. There's my Dark Magician Girl, and he pierces. So, 
I think that what my opponent just did was a huge misplay. So let's talk about it for a second. So my opponent had the option after turning my Dark Magician Girl to the defense position of activating both of his Kimia Ruler's effects and attacking me directly twice for like 5,000 damage. And he would have been able to preserve his Pierce, which means that because of his Dark Heart Celerity skill, at almost any time on a future turn, he could have probably killed me like really easily, really easily. The only reason to not do that, to hold off, is if he's fearing dying. Um, and, like, you know, because clearing two monsters is nice, as opposed to leaving me with all three. But he has, like, two 2500s, that's 5,000, plus his 6,000 life points, that's an 11,000 wall against his life points. And it is possible to break through 11,000 if you're, like, on Dragius, but he's also got two 2500s. So it would have to be something like Rice Terror Secure, plus an Aqua Monster face down. Um... Uh, and then flip those up, use Rice Terror Secure, discard a high-level monster that's 1 and 2 is Rice Terror and Aqua, 3rd is the high-level monster you're discarding. You switch both of uh, his Kimi rules to defense position. Then your 4th card, you use your Tribute Summon to Dragius. 5th and 6th are Tribute Fodder for your 7th card, which is a 2nd Dragius. And then your 8th card would be any 1,000 or more attacker. That would be lethal. But he's seen that my skill is Magician Shuffle, so he knows I can't be playing Dragius. And the only other way to deal that much damage without Dragius is with Katarna who has the 1,000 life point cost, which I wouldn't be able to pay because he's putting me down to 1,000 life points on this turn. So there's just no way for me to kill him on my next turn. I guess there's triple threat thunder that I could put one of his monsters to zero, but I had a Dark Magician Girl clogging my field. So I would have to tribute off my Dark Magician Girl at the very bare minimum if I wanted to use triple threat thunder. So that takes like what? I would have to tribute Dark Magician Girl... Uh, no, you can't run Dying Keto. You can't run Dying Keto in Magician Shuffle. There was no possible way for me to kill him on the following turn. So I think it was definitely a mistake for him to not just attack twice for directly for 5,000 damage. Yes, you let me build a big board for 8 cards, but you can so easily kill me out of nowhere with a pierce in your back pocket like that. Um, and in addition, you're still leaving me with one monster even if you kill two of my monsters like this. Which means um, I could still have 6 cards to work with, which is a decent uh, like board to build a comeback with. So I just, I, I cannot agree with the way my opponent played this. But anyways... So, I do have a Thunder the Thunder. But what I don't have is two Thunder the Thunders. Or anything else I'd need. So, yeah, I had a Thunder the Thunder, and I had a, like, a Seven Zord Witch. Like, the best play is you summon Seven Zord Witch and then summon uh, Seven Zord Magician. But I couldn't do it. I couldn't go for it because, um... I couldn't go for it because I just had no way to clear both Kime Rulers. So, it didn't really make sense to commit the Seven Zord Witch. So it made more sense to go for a more defensive play. Um, uh, I definitely cleared one Kime Ruler, and I think using the Thunder the Thunder there is correct. It just means I do a bit more damage, and there wasn't really a reason to keep the extra card in my hand. Keep the Seven Zord Witch, because you might draw into another Seven Zord Magician and be able to go for a big play on future turn. But uh, yeah, that's why I didn't set like the Seven Zord Witch, which could have been a potential option, but I figured it was better in my hand to make a better Seven Zord Magician play on a future turn if that were to come up. I also seen him use a pierce already, so I figure it's not that likely for him to have another to, you know, punish my 1400 zero defense monster. Um, now he still has a, like, third Kime ruler in the deck, so he theoretically could turn my uh, Seven Road Magician to defense position and attack directly with the third Kime ruler. That's another way I could be dead, but I'm not because he still left me with so many life points. He left me with so many life points because he didn't do att the double attacks. And that's why it's so important to get in with the Kime Ruler when you can. Because you can only use its effect to turn you summon it. And after that, it's gone. It's not like Dragius or Torna where you can keep threatening damage. If you're going to get that damage, you have to get it immediately. So, I'm not in that much damage of dying here. He's going to use Bonded Bowing. I think Bonded Bowing is a bad card. Real talk, I think Bonded Bowing is a bad card. MBT made a video talking about how it's super good and you want to run it at 3. And I think that's just wrong. Um, it bricks you so much, like, because, like, you need to get a level 7 or higher. That's the problem. You need to get a level 7 or higher warrior to summon it. But if you're bricking on high-level monsters, it's not like you can summon a low-level warrior and use this. No, because you need to get your high-level warrior in the first place. It's like a cycle that turns your Yami Ruler, like, into attack position. But you only need to be using Yami Ruler's effect maybe once or twice in the game, and you probably just can use your, um, Nandes, the Fire Awakeners, to trigger it often enough. I think this, this card is just bad. I think it takes too much resources to make it just a cycle. It's just a cycle, and it takes too much to even get to the cycle. 
I feel like. And it's only better than just a cycle if you have your Yami Ruler, but you're not even always going to have your Yami Ruler. Like in that case, he just had it as a cycle, but it's potentially it could be a dead card. I don't know. I think it's Cope. I think Bonded Boeing is uh, not great. I think you'd rather just be at a level, have that as a level 4 lower monster. Pre-cycle your card. Just play the card you'd rather have that you'd rather draw with this, which is level 4 lower monsters so you can actually tribute summon your high level monsters and not brick on them. That's my thoughts on Bonded Boning at the moment. <laughs> I'm gonna get great value here because he can't clear my 1400 defender, so I get to keep a monster. I think he knew I had that. Hold on, did he know I had that? Because, like, on my last turn, I believe, um, because on my last turn, uh, I ended up getting, no, I already had one monster on board, that's right, I had one monster on board, and then I committed two monsters, plus seven zero, that's three cards, hold on, I can go back in the, the log, I don't need to figure this out through math or whatever, um, I can check the log. Uh, did I use Seahorse Carrier? Yes, I did. I remember this. I used Seahorse Carrier to get back the Grace Princess Kana. So he knew I had Grace Princess Kana set. I don't think that's a, it's a mistake necessarily to attack with his Son of the Thunders so he can try to clear the second card. But he knew he wasn't fully clearing the board because uh, if he was paying attention because I got back Grace Princess Kana and set it with Seahorse Carrier. That's right. Um, yeah, just because I wanted to get a more defensive board because I was knew, knew I was being defensive that turn. So I used Seahorse Carrier just to get that Kana back. Because otherwise, I could have theoretically... Uh, done the play I did without needing to use Seahorse Carrier's effect, but I wouldn't have gotten to keep the Witch in hand. And I valued keeping the Witch in hand, and I valued getting the Kana back, because if I didn't get the Kana back, I would have had to, like, just set Seahorse Carrier or something like that. Um, so I think, uh, yes, using Seahorse Carrier there to keep Witch and get Kana there clearly paid off. Uh, so on my turn... Yeah, I don't have a great hand. Uh, cannot deal with the 2500. Um, I def I just need to unclog the hands. Do I set both or just one here? I don't remember. I just set one. Uh, that's probably good enough. Um, you know, the argument to setting both is that you just want to get to your power plays as soon as possible. The argument against setting both is that, like, I know my deck, right? I have 15 cards left in deck. Uh, two of them are Seven Zord Magician. This is not the Katarna version. This is pre Katarna version. Oh, then I don't know. Oh, well, two of them are Seven's Road, and two of them are Dark Magician Girl. That's four power cards in a 15-card deck. Yeah, that's probably good enough, uh, especially because I still have two Thunder the Thunders in deck. Yeah, I think it's it's pretty fine to keep the second Witch in hand. I think that's an okay play. There's an argument to setting it if you really want to get to your stuff as soon as possible, but I think holding it is also good. Fine. I think they're both fine. They're both fine options. Yeah, I can only play defensively here, I'd say. I'm already behind on life points. I think uh, summoning monsters, like if I was to summon, let's say, a Seven Zord Witch and a Chim Chimera, just to attack over these two to do a little bit of damage, it doesn't even fully clear his threat, and I'm already behind on life points, so it means I'd be losing the damage race even more. I think that's a mistake, so I think it's correct to just play defensive here. He gets Yami Ruler. Not a big deal, really, because this deck can easily cheat around it. Especially because if I do draw the one level 7 I'm playing... Uh, the, the Seven Zord Magician, I have the Seven Zord Witch, so I can always play around this. If he clears two of my... No, he only needs to clear one of my monsters, because I can tribute one of the monsters that remains. So if he clears... Unless he cle clears none of my monsters, I can always Seven Zord Witch to out the Yami Ruler. That is one benefit to this deck versus the, um, Gatarna Dragons, uh, or rather the Gatarna Twin Edge Package version of the deck that I talked about in my tier list video. But yeah, he's forced to clear, he can't do any damage... Just keep this in mind that he could have had a pierce. He could have so easily won this game with the 5,000 plus the pierce damage, but nope. Yeah, just continuing to set three. That's really all I can do in this situation. Um, he's got two 2,500s now. Um, uh, I mean, I know I have two sevens road left in deck, and I know I have two Dark Magician Girls left in deck, so there are power plays. Um, but yeah, one uh, like Torna here, Torna was never going to do much because... Um, like, they're so big defense already. Torna could switch the 17 in defense and get in, but, like, that's just asking to take damage, especially if they have more Umagumis. And I believe they've only went, like, this is their first Umagumi. So if they have two more Umagumis, Umagumi can just, like, potentially depower uh, Torna to, for 
the potential to get in with a lot of damage. And I have to be really careful with the damage race here. So I think setting three passing, tribute setting the Torna because I know it's not that valuable against this deck, still holding the Witch is probably the correct play. We do have to start paying attention to maybe deck out clocks though. Uh, because that more and more is maybe turning into my win condition. I still have two Thunder the Thunders in deck, correct? Or is one set on field? No. So I still have, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure there's still two Thunder Thunder Thunders in this deck. And there's, so there should still be maybe a way to clear, but it's two 2500s, that's going to be hard. So maybe we've got to think about deck out. That might be a mistake, using the bonding bone here. I think he's he should be approaching the point where he realizes he needs to consider deck out as a thing. I don't think bonded bowing there is correct. Like, his board is so ahead already. Not to mention, he already has five cards in hand. Like, does he have cards to set on field? I feel like you'd set the bonded bowing there. Maybe, but like, only, you only set the bonded bowing if you're setting, like, I don't know. I think bonded bowing here is almost certainly wrong. Because you have to start thinking about deck out. And because, um, like, how many cards can you commit from your hand to the board, right? He just summons another Yami Ruler, which is just so bad against this deck in particular. He tributes one of his power monsters, Kime Ruler. And, like, this is even worse against potential deck out. Uh, it was uh, after, actually, he did this play that in the moment I started thinking, wait, can I deck him out? Because he just tributed, like, um, you know, like, he's tributing away his power plays. He's removing the power plays from the table and making it easier for me to have a maybe even not deck out comeback if I was to clear these Yami Rulers. Though that would also proceed to maybe a deck out comeback if uh, he's winning enough in the life point race. Yeah, so all this does... All this does is it trades his 25-21 for a 25-25. That's the only thing tributing the Kime Ruler and doing this does. I think this is a big mistake. I think this is a, like he's this is a King of Games game, but I think this is a bit of a not used to what deck out games look like type of play. There is no reason to do this. It makes his board very small better, and it really speeds up his deck out clock. When you're this ahead, just sit on your advantage. You do not need to be speeding up your own advantage clock. Your own deck out clock, I mean. <clears throat> Alright, so I did finally get a 7 zoned Magician, but the question is, like, we, like, if you look at the deck size, we both have 8 cards in deck. Um, the opponent is drawing first. If they draw four cards, they all have three cards left to play. But they don't necessarily have to play any of them, which means they could still have three turns before they die. Whereas I'm going to have to be, if I want to survive, committing like three quarters to the board each turn. So I can't just set three and pass each turn and hope to win. I have to make some kind of push here. I have 3,900 life points. That's okay. So I'm going to be uh, going for my witch play. I was holding that witch for a while. I could finally use it. Yeah, and then I tribute, yeah, that's right, um, I wanted to be careful about leaving, uh, like, because the other option would have been tributing Dark Magician Girl, and or rather, getting rid of the Dark Magician Girl, so that I could set the Thunder the Thunder. That would have been the other option, but that would not have cleared double Yami Ruler. And my thought process here, I'm pretty sure, was that I wanted to clear, no, I can't clear his two Yami Rulers, Dark Magician Girl would crash. What was my thought process here? Um, I just cleared the Umagumi and the Yami Ruler, and that's good enough. Uh, I think I was thinking about Phantom Bind. I think that was where my mind was, right? Because one, two... This is a bit Spellcaster Light. This is a Spellcaster Light-ish version. It's not as Spellcaster Light as it would be if it was on the Gitarna, but it's got one, two, three, uh, four, five, six. That, yeah, I was thinking about Phantom Bind. That's right. I had six Spellcasters in my graveyard. No, I had five before Seven Zord Witch. But five spellcasters in grave means seven zord witch goes down to fifteen hundred, which dies to the umagumi, and I couldn't afford that. So I'm like, I'll tribute someone for dark magician girl. She'll be twenty five, which shrunk by six is nineteen hundred, which still clears umagumi. And seven zord magician always clears Yamiro here. I don't think there's any point to count. He's going to be fine. He's going to clear it. Um, I, I'm sure I counted when I played the actual game, but I'm not going to bother counting here. That's why I tributed for Dark Magician Girl instead of the better play, normally. If you weren't worrying about uh, Phantom Mind, would definitely be commit the Seven Sword Witch, set the Thunder Thunder face down, clear the Umagumi, keep the board presence. But in this case, like, I can't afford losing to Phantom Mind here. And that's probably what it is, uh, because I've already seen a Pierce, I've already seen a Bonded Boeing. And he would have killed me by now if that was another Pierce, I believe. Um... I've also seen two bonded Boeing, so I think it only makes sense statistically. It's probably a Phantom Bind. 
Um, so I play around it. And I'm pretty sure it does end up being a Phantom Bind. I believe. Isn't that right? Or am I wrong? There it is, there's the Phantom Bind. I played around it, success. Even with the mill from Seven's Road, I was still just big enough to not crash, thank God. <laughs> Uh, and this means his board is now cleared up, so if he wants to not die, he's going to have to commit resources to the board. Granted, I did just mill uh, my third 7 zone Magician, which is not good. It removes, like, all I have left in deck is, like, one Dark Magician Girl as a power play. That means it's going to be hard to clear his Yami Ruler, to be fair. Though I believe I still have, like, Thunder the Thunders left in there, maybe? Uh, I have one Thunder the Thunder. I don't have many ways to clear this second Yami Ruler, but at the very least, I could crash with my Dark Magician Girl, or I could clear it with this. If he doesn't, he's going to have to commit something to the board to not die to life points. He's low enough that he can't just be be too passive, which means I can maybe win by deck out. That's where my mind is right now. Can I win by deck out? Um, he sets two. He tributes them. That's great to see. He's committing more and more resources to the board. He's committing his whole hand. But he does not win this turn, which is important. And I wasn't too afraid of him winning this turn because, you know, he's on Dark Hearts of Celerity. He's not playing like Dragius or Katarna or anything. So his huge damage put he doesn't have huge damage pushes like that. Um, so I am not dead yet. He has four cards left in deck. He put himself at exactly four cards in deck with one card in hand, which means he gets exactly one more turn. Um, but I'm in a bit of an awkward position too. Um, oh, don't spoil it. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm in an awkward position too. Pretend this is still in my hand. I have five cards in hand and two cards in deck. If I can set three and pass and just hope he can't get through, then I would win, right? But the thing is that if I set three and pass, even if I set Seahorse Carrier, set Kana, set Thunder the Thunder, keep two cards in hand, I only have two cards in deck. That means I would die on my next turn because I wouldn't be able to draw the full three cards because you deck out as soon as you can't draw as much as you need to draw for the drawing up to five cards requirement. Um, but then I realized something. I have 2,000 life points. I've got a Seahorse Carrier with 700 attack. He's got a Yami Roll with 2,500 attack. 25 minus 7 is only 18. That does not kill me. And uh, if I use this, I get one more resource back, which means I can hold, I can still set two cards, hold a third card in my hand, still have two in the deck to give me a one more turn while still committing three resources. It puts me at 200 life points, and it means I'm dead to like so many, like any debuff would kill me here. But I wasn't really thinking, I didn't actually spend time in the moment to think about what could kill me because I realized this was the only way I could ever win this game. But uh, if we spend time right now and look at his graveyard, how many Thunder the Thunders are in here? Is he playing Thunder the Thunder? One, two... Uh, does he have a third Thunder the Thunder? No, I don't see a third. Maybe he's not playing three. Because Thunder the Thunder is like the way he would kill me here. But I guess he's he's not playing three in the deck is what it looks like. Um, but, uh, well, I'll show you the last turn. I mean, yeah, I go ahead and get a card back and I set two face down. I keep three, keep three in hand. And, well, I guess you'll see. Can he debuff me? Can he kill me? Oh, hey, look, Umagumi. Umagumi can buff, debuff me by 500. He just has to switch, like, one Yami Ruler to defense, debuff this to 200, and then his other Yami Ruler hits over it. But wait a second! Umagumi has to send a card from his deck to the graveyard, so that's not an out. He also switches to defense mode, which, like, do you have a pierce? Oh, now he summons for Kime Ruler. Aha, his third Kime Ruler. Now he can win, because this attacks directly, because they're all in defense. Wait a second. Kime Ruler also needs a card in the deck. That's not an out. And he can't beat me. And I win by deck out. Oh, uh, beautiful. Uh. So yeah, remember how he could have hit me for 5,000 in the beginning of the game? That extra 5,000 sure would have been nice, huh? And that's the game! <laughs> uh, I just thought that was a fun game to show because I thought my opponent definitely made some mistakes. But also, you know, keep in mind the deck out condition. Like, when you're ahead on advantage, don't squander that by making yourself, just opening yourself up to a deck out possibility. And also, Seahorse Carrier, clutch value for that one extra card. That was great. Winning with just 200 life points. Love it. Uh, see you in the next video. I have, I have at least one more of these I definitely want to do.